Thank you all for joining us. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Do we still have COVID things we're reading? No. Oh, hooray. Okay. Um, so do we have any members of the public who are here to comment on things that are not on the agenda or online? No, have not received any speaker cards or raised hands. Okay. Um, and Amy, do you have a few comments on our schedules and meetings? Good morning, Amy French, Chief Planning Official. I, for the convenience of the board, um, I want to um, basically with the call to order, uh, we need to do that um, and recognize that we have a new member, Samantha Roman. So um, if we could do the, do we do the call to order? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, roll call. Roll call. <laughs> Chair Willis? Present. Vice Chair Pease? Board Member Eagleson Cheslowich? Present. Board Member Heinrich is absent. Board Member McKinnon? Present. Board Member Roman? Present. And Board Member Wimmer is also absent. We have a quorum. Thank you. So uh, just also an acknowledgement, um, in addition to, and welcome to S Samantha Roman, uh, our two uh, incumbents uh, in that, uh, were uh, in that um, lead up to today, <laughs> uh, we have Christian reappointed for his, uh, the, t the next term, as well as Alyssa. So um, congratulations. Uh, so then on to your public comment. I think we passed public comment. Okay. So we let's don't have anyone here to speak on anything not on the agenda. That's what I understand. Yeah, okay, I, cool. I, I just skipped the roll call. So okay. <laughs> minor problem. Um, but no, I don't think there is anybody here. Okay. And they haven't shown up in the last four seconds, right, Veronica? Okay, thank you. Um, so just briefly on meetings. And yes. Uh, so the upcoming meetings are shown on the screen. As always, we have two meetings a month that are on the calendar. We don't necessarily meet each and every one of those um, based on our uh, what's on our plate. Um, and just to recognize that um, board member Wimmer has arrived. Um, the, the next meeting is a special meeting and it's an evening meeting and we have been planning for this. It's the community meeting for the project we have embarked upon the inventory update. We're calling it the reconnaissance um, survey. So uh, please do mark your calendars. Um, if you can attend, <clears throat> it will be great. It's an opportunity to meet with the public. Um, we've done, uh, and we can talk about this a little bit later on the agenda after the regular items um, as far as preparation for that meeting. but. Um, a lot, a lot going on, letters have gone out and cards and we're, we're getting ready for that. So um, other meetings upcoming, I, you know, at some point we'll have a chair and vice chair, I think uh, election, um, cause we, oh, and to acknowledge that um, board member Heinrich has arrived. I think we are all seven, is that correct? And Mike, did Mike say? Yeah, okay, seven of us, excellent. Uh, so we'll, we'll probably target a future meeting for for that. All right, and with that, I'll move to the next item. Thank you, Amy. Um, I noticed on the screen that the <clears throat> November 23rd meeting had shown back up right before Thanksgiving. Was that intentional or is that? Oh. I mean, we can always cancel it later. It's pretty far off, but. Yeah, it's pretty far off, but um, is I that actually I mean Thanksgiving? <laughs> No, oh, okay. I don't think so, is it? Oh, maybe. Oh, I think it might be. It's always a possibility. I guess so. we're going to cancel that one. Probably. <laughs> okay, thank you. So let's move on to our study section. Will you sort of guide us through this one? Yes, um, and before we get to that, I'll just, just note again, um, just to highlight, this is related to the upcoming um, for the public uh, April 25th meeting. Um, just to know we have a web page. I just wanted to highlight that um, we have a, portions of our webpage. Sometimes it's hard to find things. I'm just sharing on the screen uh, where you can find the properties eligible for listing here um, on that same page. It, it has a link called project page and you can click on that and uh, get to this project page. I've, I've condensed these things, but it does show the schedule upcoming, some FAQs about this reconnaissance survey that we're embarking upon. So just to be make that 
um, awareness. And again, we can come back to these slides later when we're um, at the end of this uh, meeting to if there's any questions that HRB has. So study session. Uh, the, pro the property is um, owned by Stanford here. Uh, it's 27 University. It has on it the MacArthur Park, which is um, the Veterans Memorial Building. Uh, and uh, the flagpole, which I don't uh, recall exactly where it is, but um, it, it may or may not be on Stanford property or public property where, you know, this is, this is not an application on file. This, this is a request by uh, multiple parties to uh, present to the HRB um, about this flagpole that is currently covered up with um, some uh, plywood or something like that. So uh, here today to give presentations each 10 minutes, we'll start with uh, Laura Jones, who is from Stanford University, and then we'll um, uh, move to William von Konel, I hope I don't mispronounce that, uh, for another 10 minute presentation. So um, again, the city has not been involved in, you know, refereeing or doing anything on this property. There's no application on file. And that's really all I have to say. And I'll turn it over to um, Laura Jones if she would like to come up and we'll stop sharing. And uh, Amy, do you have the slide I sent you yesterday? Yes, but give me a second. I don't think that's I right. loaded it up. Uh, oh, sorry. And I'm trying to get out of this one right now. Hold on. That's right. Uh, good morning. I'm Laura Jones, Stanford University archaeologist and executive director of Heritage Services. I'm here today representing the university. Um, however, I also live in Palo Alto. And with me are Megan Sweezy Fogarty from our Office of Community Engagement and Julie Kane, uh, the historian on our staff who did the research about the flagpole. Stanford uh, is here to request advice from the HRB on the treatment of the flagpole at the hostess house. Um, that's its national register name. My staff has done extensive research on the two flagpoles that have been associated with the site. The first flagpole was donated by the American Legion, the second flagpole by the Native Sons of the Golden West. A summary of that research material is included in the packet. Um, in the course of our research effort, we encountered many recent articles on copper theft and public monuments and on reconsideration of plaques that honor the native sons of the Golden West. So those are also in the packet. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge that our shared past at Stanford and in Palo Alto includes racist and harmful practices in the past, um, as well as patriotism, honor and service that is represented uh, by this building and the flagpole. Uh, I'd like to make it clear that Stanford has acted in good faith to protect this flagpole and that we honor and respect the contributions of American Legion post 375 in the care of the flags at the site. Both flagpoles uh, were gifts to the city of Palo Alto and installed by the city on land that had been leased from Stanford for El Camino Park in 1915. Um, in 1999, the city terminated the lease over the two buildings, the former Red Cross building uh, and the hostess house and Stanford took over the care of that property. We've invested significantly in deferred maintenance improvements and we're committed to the preservation of the hostess house and the flagpole. From a historic preservation perspective, um, there are at least two options that meet the Secretary of the Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties restoring the original American Legion flagpole um, or repairing the native sons of the Golden West flagpole. And so you'll see those two uh, flagpoles on the summary slide. So we're here today to sincerely ask for your input. We believe this is heritage that is shared by Palo Alto and Stanford and our veterans community. Um, and that uh, the best way to work through what the proper treatment is is to do that in a collaborative way. So thank you for your attention. And Julie and I are, are both available to answer questions at any time if you have them about the history of the flagpole. Thank you. Thank you. Amy, can we ask questions now or do you think we wanna wait? 
Yes, the study session format is open uh, okay. at the pleasure of the chair. Do we have questions for Laura? Oh, just me. So um, I got to admit the, the two, I mean, there seem to be two aspects. One is protecting the plaques and one is um, censoring the plaques, I guess, um, for want of a better word. Um, and, and what was the original motivation for removing the plaques? Um, when the plaques were, uh, so when the plinth was vandalized um, and we had it boxed to prevent further removal of the copper, um, we removed the plaques so that they could be seen. And in fact, they were on display at Veterans Day. So we have those plaques um, and so they're accessible in a way that they wouldn't be uh, if they were behind that plywood. So we didn't remove them to censor them. At the time, I really didn't know anything about them. Um, the, we removed them to store them appropriately and be, have access to them. So is the building occupied right now or is the building empty? The building is occupied by the MacArthur Park restaurant and it continues to operate there. So what, why? I mean, it looked like relatively minor damage in the photographs. I, I did not actually see it in person. Um, it seems like an extreme reaction to remove them, but what was, what was the decision on that one? You know, our concern was that the, was that the base would continue to um, be damaged because there are now holes in the copper, right? And so that people would copper thieves would continue to strip pieces of it off. And so while we were trying, and so we started our research effort about what's, what's the history of the plinth, what's the history of the flagpole, what's the appropriate historic treatment for this. And we were concerned that it needed to be protected. Um, at the time, uh, the restaurant was closed because of the pandemic. The restaurant in the depot had closed um, ridership on Caltrain had plummeted. And so there was really no one there, right? And we felt that, that it was more at risk because of the lack of you know, visible people on the site. Thank you for protecting them. Yeah. We appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. um, so currently does Stanford have a plan to replace them? No, um, we really felt that this was something we wanted to talk with. Palo Alto um, and continue to talk with the veterans about is to understand um, you know, what the treatments are that are um, consistent with the Secretary of the Interior standards. That's what we do in our office at Stanford is make sure that those standards are met. And then we realized that um, as we did the research that the, the hostess house, community house had had a different flagpole um, that that flagpole had been donated by the American Legion. And we then also became aware of um, uh, the controversies surrounding the Native Sons of the Golden West. And so it felt appropriate to have a, you know, to, to bring it to a community discussion about, you know, how we both honor veterans, honor our flag, honor our history, and make sure we're not perpetuating um, uh, values that we no longer hold as a community. Thank you. Anybody else? Samantha. Thank you for the presentation. Um, so it really sounds like there are, and correct me if this is uh, incorrect, there are three issues at hand here. Number one, the flagpole itself, because it, the original flagpole of Palo Alto is no longer in place. Um, number two, protecting the plinth and the copper that sits there. And then number three, the um, possible revision or the best way to now express the narrative of an organization that maybe doesn't represent Palo Alto's current values. Would you say that's correct? Yes, I think that's a very good summary. Okay, so as far as the Secretary of the Interior Standards is, that part of the question related to the flagpole itself. And can you elaborate on what that question actually is? So um, 
you know, I included a little bit of this in the packet. The hostess house, community house, veterans memorial building, that building is listed on the national register. The, um, the flagpole is a, is a feature of its site, right? Um, the, but is not individually listed. Mm -hmm. It is listed by Palo Alto on your inventory, mm -hmm. right? So it is, um, and so we would normally presume that it is also a historic resource because it's locally listed. Mm -hmm. um, but the hostess house has a period of that is its period when it was the community center for Palo Alto, right? And when it had the American Legion flagpole. Mm -hmm. And so it gets really complicated and technical that way. But the way um, I think we view it, and I, I know the way that, you know, in my conversations with the American Legion Post, um, we view a flagpole at the, at the hostess house, Veterans Memorial Building, to be an essential feature of its site. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and alterations to the historic resource, the exterior of the historic resource, um, I believe under, under Palo Alto's ordinances are, are subject to, to review and should comply with the standards. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the question that, that Stanford's property management office asked me is what's the, what are the appropriate treatments under the standards? Mm -hmm. And I said, in this particular case, there may be more than one. The, the issue with the Native Sons of the Golden West flagpole um, is that it's been modified a number of times, mm -hmm. right? And so it doesn't, um, uh, it has less integrity as a historic resource. Mm -hmm. It's not the original pole. It's, it, you know, it, but, but yeah. right, the plinth um, uh, with its plaques on it um, it's been moved. I mean, it, it, it has a more complicated history, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's, and which is why I wanted to say there are options, mm -hmm. I think, about um, what kind of treatment uh, would meet the standards. But it's all sort of driven by the context of, of the build, the Julia Morgan building and its site, right, which in, has included a flagpole since 1920. Mm -hmm. The way I see it is that these are actually two separate issues that Stanford has taken it upon themselves to put these issues all in one bucket. Um, the issue of restoring the plaques is, will they be safe? Will they be protected? Will they be damaged or experience theft once again? A second issue that I think is something that we need to look at as a historic resource board and as a community is how we want to present our revised narrative of history. For example, the Native Sons of the Golden West also has a plaque at El Palo Alto. I'm not sure if that sits on Stanford land or Palo Alto's land. That would be another plaque that then we should reevaluate. If we are going to reevaluate this one Native Sons of the Golden West plaque, we should reevaluate all of the ones in the Stanford and Palo Alto vicinity, in my opinion. Um, thank you. I didn't know there was a plaque at the El Palo Alto. Um, and I, I do believe that that is also Stanford property. I think the other thing that we might want to interject here is that, uh, as I recall, the American Legion flagpole was original to the MacArthur Park building, whereas the um, Sons of the Golden West one was um, very much on the circle and a gateway between Palo Alto and Stanford and therefore it's all kinds of other symbolism involved. Anyone else? Yeah, could you uh, go into a little bit more detail about the two options that you're considering that you mentioned? Well, I, I mean, I think there is an option that meets the standards um, to restore the first flagpole. And then we'd have to talk about what happens to the plinth, um, but it would be uh, consistent with its period of significance and the Secretary of the Interior standards to restore um, the first flagpole that had been on the site from 1920 uh, until 1941. Um, the second option is to repair the plinth um, uh, and keep the existing metal pole that's on the plinth, um, and then to discuss, you know, what to, how to how to interpret um, the plaques. 
um, and how to protect it, right? So that that that's also an option. Um, you know, we haven't we haven't done a design of that. You know, we we did consult with some repair specialists who told us that while they could um, repair the copper, that they couldn't. There there is no way to protect it from being damaged, other than putting up a very tall fence around it, right? So we. That's how far we went with it. And then it was really important. We reached out to Amy and said, we, we wanna have a community conversation about this to understand um, whether we should be developed because eventually we will need to apply for a permit to alter the setting of the hostess house and it will come before you for review. And so it, we thought it was important to get some feedback early um, and because we have a very interested um, community uh, partner to, to make sure that we were moving forward together on developing those options. Yeah. Question. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I just have a couple of quick questions, I think. Um, the original flagpole, I'm assuming we just have photographic evidence of it. There's no physical remains of that flagpole or is there? I, I have not heard that there are any physical remains. Okay. I, we could ask Steve Steiger whether it's squirreled away in the Roth building, but I don't think so. Okay. Um, and then the current flagpole, like the date of that flagpole, how does that interact with the period of significance of the site? Is it exclusive? Is it fully out of the period of significance or does it overlap somehow? It, you know, it's a little bit fuzzy in the 1930s. So there, there is, uh, so the the National Register listing is because of the association with Julia Morgan and as the first community center in the United States. Um, that community center use continues um, into the 1930s, um, 36 or 37, 33 or 34. Um, the, uh, the veterans um, become associated with the building at that point but then during World War II, it's operated again um, by community members because most of the veterans had returned to service. And so there's, there's some muddiness about the, the kind of handoff between the community center function and the veterans function in the 30s. But by and large, the reason that the Native Sons flagpole is there was because of the building of the undercrossing and overpass, which, um, uh, replaced University Circle. And so here was this, the city flagpole. Um, and so it was convenient, right, to move it over and replace the other flagpole. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is not William Von Canel. Actually, our commander, William Von Canel, is sitting here. Uh, I am the pinch hitter uh, who has come up. I am the vice commander of Post 375. My name is Ray Powell. I'm a 35-year veteran of the United States Air Force who retired just two years ago and uh, am here uh, working with uh, people at Stanford on a project. Um, I'm here uh, not as a historian, so I, if you ask me history questions, I will probably defer. Um, I am here to represent the veterans community, which has a great interest in the flagpole and actually in the building itself. I also want to acknowledge and thank Dr. Jones and the, uh, the, the Stanford uh, administration for bringing this to the HRB. We think this is a very positive development and we wanna thank the HRB for taking this. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the American Legion Post 375 has been associated with the Veterans Memorial Building since 1930 uh, and has actually worked to maintain the flagpole display through the years at the, the various stages um, and actually still does so today, although it's a little more challenging with a big box around it. Um, in fact, it involves the fire department. <laughs> so, uh, and we have obviously are, are acting really as the primary advocates for the building and the flagpole. Uh, and we're really excited today that our department commander, uh, uh, Jerry Romano has flown in 
to lend his support. So thank you, Jerry. He obviously has a mustache in the in the photo. So uh, he uh, he obviously shaved for this uh, this occasion. Next slide, please. Um, so we, we, when we think of the flagpole, we think of it as a whole uh, with the Veterans Memorial Building because we think that there are you know, our concerns over the flagpole extend to the building itself um, for reasons I'll explain later. The Veterans Memorial Building was, was dedicated uh, in 1976 uh, here in Palo Alto and, and has made it into various registers as a result. Um, and it is something that is of great importance to Palo Alto veterans. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, obviously, as has been mentioned, is in the National Register of, of Historic Places. Uh, it, as the hostess house, it, its original name at uh, Camp Fremont in Men Menlo Park before it was moved, uh, it was a very important site for uh, soldiers going off to uh, fight, to meet with their families in a, in a place, and it was run actually at the time by the YWCA. Uh, I think very important to the hostess house. And again, I, I know this is about the flagpole, but again, we think of this as sort of a whole. Uh, the architect was the very famous Julia Morgan. Um, and it was at least believed at the time by the city council of Palo Alto to have been the first quote community house for a, uh, a city in the nation when it was established here in Palo Alto. Um, and the, you know, the, the, under the roles, uh, the, uh, American Legion Post essentially advocates for the building and represents the United Veterans Council of Palo Alto here. Um, next slide, please. And as was mentioned by Dr. Jones, uh, the, the, the flagpole is listed as another feature of the, the Veterans Memorial Building, which is part of why we keep it, uh, those two issues together. Next slide, please. Uh, I don't want to you know, go too deep into the memorial flagpole history because Dr. Jones has already done that very well. Um, and, but just to note that the, you know, at the time, of course, the plaques uh, commemorated the sponsors and founders and veterans. We understand the complicated history of some of those founders, um, but uh, want to remember that there was a, a sense of civic and national pride around those. Um, and that they were uh, cited here at the Veterans Building, uh, you know, which was itself a World War I memorial and has had a continuous veterans, veterans presence through the years. Next slide, please. Um, you know, so optimally what would have happened when this, was, uh, when this first happened was there would have been a, a law enforcement report um, for whatever reason that didn't happen. The re only reason we bring it up is because as I'll cover in the next slide, this you know, damaging federal, uh, uh, excuse me, damaging veterans memorials is a federal crime. Um, and that you know, would have raised the profile of this particular incident. Uh, the, we're happy that we are finally now in a historical project review. And again, thank, thank for uh, Stanford for bringing this forward. Uh, and they've been uh, very good about working with us on this. Uh, and they're, you know, part of why we brought this to them and, and they brought it to you is you ultimately, you know, optimally this would have been corrected promptly. Uh, COVID clearly played a role in why it wasn't, um, but we would like to see it you know, done as promptly as possible. Next slide. And here's the, the, the excuse me, the, the language on uh, why or and how the uh, destruction of veter veterans memorials is a federal crime. Next slide. We think of the, the building and the flagpole and we think of it in two senses. One is the, in, the historical integrity uh, and we are concerned about that, but also is the public good that the veterans building and the flagpole have represented through time. Um, and we are very happy that Palo Alto and Stanford worked very closely with us to bring uh, the last um, Veterans Day event back to the was presided and spoke at the at the event, as did uh, four star uh, admiral from Ho the Hoover Institution. Um, the, the Stanford was very uh, good, and as was the city, by the way, in in helping set up that event. Uh, so while we uh, maybe were the, uh, the instigators, we had a lot of help uh, and we're very grateful for that. But you know, just sort of reaffirming the importance of the building and the flagpole to the veterans here in Palo Alto. And we'd really hope to see that continue 
because that's really the last place that the veterans have that marks our history here. Uh, next slide. Um, we do think it's, it's important in this context to bring up uh, sort of the, the, the tension that has gone on through, especially recent years. Uh, Here's some slides from 2021 in which housing proposals were made that would have essentially removed the Veter Veterans Memorial Building and the flagpole and replaced it with housing. We understand that the, the housing issue is a very pressing one for Palo Alto and for the whole area. It, which is why we think this is so important to make sure that, uh, next slide please, that uh, when slides like this are produced in the future, they list uh, the heritage and the historical preservation as part, as one of the considerations um, rather than sort of barriers to be removed. Uh, now it doesn't list uh, heritage specifically, but it lists, uh, you know, uh, as public goods that would be sort of superseded by a housing proposal. Uh, next slide, please. So essentially what we're, what we're advocating for today is that uh, the, the flagpole together with the Veterans Memorial Building are a public good that need to be preserved. Um, that again, the, you know, the, what we would like to see is sort of the, the uh, historic preservation code applied and um, that uh, we consider even uh, perhaps even some kind of resolution in the future to, uh, to, to preserve the Veterans Memorial Building and the flagpole into the future, it's just to sort of stave off uh, the other pressing needs that seem to want, be wanting to push it to the side. And the last slide, please. I'd just like to say um, that as a veteran in Palo Alto, uh, it's a, the veterans ac across the country uh, are in a very different state than we were 100 years ago when you know, a lot of this started. We obviously uh, no longer have a draft, so there are fewer veterans. We, uh, in Northern California, a lot of the bases were closed, so there are fewer veterans here. And um, it is very important to those veterans who remain that we have some sense of belonging and community and integrity about us uh, and that the community continues to value us. And to see uh, our final monuments here in Palo Alto disappear would be very heartbreaking for the veterans of Palo Alto. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have questions? Is there anywhere that shows all the text on the plaques? I couldn't read any of the photographs. Uh, I'm sure there is. Um, I don't know. You know I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know if there's a, a place on a website or anything. I'm staring at Dr. Jones here. Um, we will transcribe it and send it through Amy for you. I don't think I typed them up. They're lists of names, essentially. Um, there's not a lot of um, other text on the plaques. I think the Grand Army of the Republic plaque, um, which honors American Civil War veterans may have a little bit of text on it. But I, I do understand that the plaques can be hard to read by themselves and we'll just send the text of the four um, to Amy and she can provide it to you. I believe it's packet page 69. Um, They're just, it's just really hard to read sometimes yeah. the bronze. Um, I did everything I could in Photoshop to make that readable, but there's not a lot of text on them other than the lists of the members of the Native Sons um, of the Golden West. And the list of the Civil War veterans on the, who were, pre, who were still living at the time of the Grand Army of the Republic plaque. Oh, Chair Willis, I need to interrupt this uh, particular item for a second because we had a member of the public, Darlene Yapley, who still has her hand raised. She was raising her hand apparently, as she says in a chat, um, while we were in the items not on the agenda. So none of us were focused on the chat. Um, so Darlene, um, I, I just would, if through the chair, is it possible just to pause and let her speak just in case she wanted to leave this meeting? I don't know. It's awkward. Awkward. <laughs> Sorry. Um, do you mind? Okay. Sorry. Um, let's do it. Okay. Um, and we probably need a better system for the hand raising because yes, uh, I couldn't see. No, it. I, I was sharing my screen as well. So, 
Um, we'll try better next next week. <laughs> Are you able to pull her up to yes. speak? This is Darlene Yapley. Hello, this is my second meeting of raising my hand and I was not called on the previous meeting February 9th either. So the chat was not activated until you had a study session. It wasn't activated and comments not on the agenda. So again, I, I think you encourage residents to attend. I just think it's been hard as a remote citizen to participate. Um, at the HRB meeting, I did raise my hand to make a comment on the historical resources inventory kickoff. It was not recognized and the packet states that up to five minutes from the presentation, you'll be able to comment. I was clearly disappointed. I was un unable to speak and ask questions and possibly get answers, which is the outstanding forum you have right now. Today's comment is on the Rena Reconnaissance Survey. The March 21st Council directed staff not only to make recommendations for the inventory, but also to collaborate with the HRB for community engagement. I'm not aware of the collaboration for the engagement because at the August 25th HRB meeting, it was stated that 10 people from the 130 person list help review and create the outreach content. During my comment, I volunteered and Chair Willis stated they would put me on the list. This did not happen. So is staff and HRB collaborating on the community engagement? And if so, how? For slide task 1A that was presented and also the slide deck is not in the, the notes of the meeting, the historical resources reconnaissance presented on 2.9, a list that would be made available to homeowners. And they showed that there's a legend that says verified and questionable eligibility. Can you not make this list available? And why would it not be available so people have an understanding of where things are today? On the project website, it says incentives, but there's no link to the documents. It also states that the uh, HRB will nominate to the city to make a decision on the housing to be on the inventory. And in another location, it says, doesn't mention the HRB, it just says that the city will designate the inventory. So is this the same process or different? For many Palo Alto residents, our homes are the most consequential asset we have. Therefore, this reconnaissance project is important and having authentic community engagement is critical for its success. I hope the community meeting will be emphasizing dialogue and not too much presentation. The property owners should have the opportunity to ask important questions and get straightforward answers. I hope there will be a transparent and understandable information exchange with consultants and staff. Thank you for your time and I look forward to the April 25th meeting and thank you for allowing me to speak outside of the flow. Thank you. Thank you, Darlene. I think that's, um, I apologize. Um, I guess we need to work on our system. Um, it was not, I'm not sure what happened, but we have obviously have a technical glitch, um, which hopefully we will fix before the next meeting. Um, and I look forward to meeting you at our community engagement meeting um, on the 20, whatever it is, I can't remember, sorry. <laughs> um, but um, great points that you made and um, thank you very much. And while we're at it, sorry, through the chair again, uh, I noticed another chat from Mr. Martin Summer. I don't know if he's speaking on this item or, you know, uh, I don't know if he had his hand up during the prior or if we hadn't enabled that in that segment. So I guess a question would be, does Martin Summer wish to speak on this item and are we ready for that? Or is he wishing to speak on, not on the agenda? So it's a question. So Martin, if you're hearing this, if you want to chat your answer, <laughs> which item do you wish to speak on? Okay, we're still in hybrid mode and it's awkward. Apologies. Okay, so what I'm hearing is we need to work on our... Uh, <laughs> our okay. Answered, he wishes to speak on the flagpole item. So we can return to the item we were just on. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have other questions from the board or comments? I just have a quick clarifying question. So I'm glad, Amy, that you pointed out that the plaques I, on page um, 69 of our packet, are these the four plaques that are on each side of the flagpole base? Okay. 
were, so they've been removed to be restored or preserved. Um, and I know that this is maybe a different element of this review or, and possibly more, a more sensitive element to it. But I'm just curious, I was just looking at them and I, I, um, I mean, maybe some of these historic plaques have background information or, or have meaning beyond what it says on the plaque. I look at the plaques and I don't really necessarily see anything that is immediately um, offensive to me, but I do, I guess, in further thinking about the restoration, if in fact there are some community members who react to plaques such as this in a, um, in a not always positive way, would that invite more vandalism? I'm sure you've already kind of thought about that, but I mean, maybe that is one thing to think about. Um, and, and I don't know, I don't have the context or even the, you know, the his, as a historic board, I mean, there's so many social issues that arise out of historic preservation. So, and maybe this, this, this lends itself to that kind of sensitive review, but I, um, I'm just glad that I had a chance to kind of glance at it and think further about what this possibly represents. Um, I have an additional question looking at these, um, looking at the plaques here, they are a little hard to read in our packet, but some of the dates on the plaques are in the early 1900s and seem to date to that original period of significance. Do we know if, uh, it's a little hard to, it, they're hard to read. So I, I guess my question is what those earlier dates and how they interact with the earlier poll, the current poll, and what's they're, going on there? They're related to the gift of the university circle flagpole. Okay. Um, and so, uh, so when you see, I think it's 1908 is one of those dates. So they're related to the fundraising for the university circle flagpole that was led by the native sons of the golden West. Oh, okay. Right. Um, right. So there at that, at that point, there were two flagpoles. There was, you know, right. Or, or later, um, during the hostess house period of significance, the university C circle flagpole was still at university circle and the American Legion flagpole was at, um, the hostess house. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Do we have any further comments or questions? Well, thank you guys for bringing this up. Um, you know, it's a it's a really critical junction of um, our communities, you know, between the veterans and Stanford and Palo Alto and the entrance off of El Camino and the entrance from the train station, which would have been the primary well, entrance at that point in time. Um, and I think it's really important as we look at that area, which the trains tracks are being redone. Um, we probably are gonna add something, I don't know if, if it's housing or what happens in that area, but you know, it, there's gonna be change. And I think these are really good things to think about. Um, I, I did wanna say that, you know, the restoration of the original flagpole, the veterans flagpole that was originally there is, that's not happening. You know, you could reconstruct it, but I don't think we're restoring it. Um, and I do think the flagpole that exists was, at one time, really symbolic. And I don't think this is just important to veterans. I think it's important to all of us as a community um, that you know we are a team. And it, it's really easy to forget that in this day and age when, you know, I know when I moved to Palo Alto, I felt like I kind of lived between San Francisco and San Jose. I, I didn't really feel anchored here. Um, and, and I think that's important that we all have some sense of belonging. And I think that it's for veterans, but it's also for the rest of us. So thank you. Um, I look forward to this going in a really positive direction in the near future. Um, and um, thank you for working on it. Chair Willis, um, might we open it to the public comment on this item? Oh, what a good idea. <laughs> okay, thank you. And I understand we have somebody online to comment. Uh, yes, Martin Sommer, we can unmute yourself. You have three minutes. Okay, great. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, yes. hello. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
I know I, I read the document. So first off, I, I'm a member of the public. I live across the way at 427 Alma Street um, facing west. Um, I, I read the packet, I read the documents, and I understand that most of this conversation is about the, the base of the flagpole and the plackets and whether or not they should be replaced and so on and so forth. Um, I wanted to also state, though, the importance of actually the top portion of the flagpole, which actually maintains the two flags, the U.S. flag and the prison, POW, prisoner of war flag. Um, I look at them as, as on a daily basis. I actually have, I guess I'm fortunate in Palo Alto, but I, I have a bird's eye view of the two flags out my living room looking well west uh, towards over Stanford at the uh, Santa Cruz Mountains. And it's a beautiful view. And um, I would hate to see, for example, either A, the, the flagpole removed or replaced, or B, temporarily taken down because a lot of things temporary tend to last years and years. So uh, Dr. Jones had actually mentioned option two, which is to maintain the current flagpole. I fully support that. Um, and I've, again, just to restate, I've I've been looking at this flagpole and the two flags for over 25 years, and um, it's a fortunate view, but it's a beautiful view. And I just, you know, wanted to put that out during this conversation to to maintain that. So that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. That was nice. Um, any other comments from the public? Uh, not seeing any other raised hands, unless. Give them a minute. I have a question. When will we be discussing the social issue of the plinth? Do you want to discuss the social issue of the plinth? <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. Do you have do you have comments or questions on that particular issue? Yes, I do. I would like to see the plinth restored as is and use it as a teaching moment to everyone about what the you know the good of the native sons of the Golden West and the bad of the of that organization too, because you know for them to do. Um, Fundraising and get a, a you know an American flagpole set up and everything shows great patriotism, and but you know the racism part I am not really that aware of what it was that they did, and it'd be good for everyone to know you know that this organization was good and you know bad, but you can't erase history, and I don't think we should be doing that. I think also, I just wanted to touch on Dr. Jones' original uh, request of the board was to offer advice on the treatment of the two flagpoles. So I just wanna make sure that we end with that advice that she's seeking. I think we've received the information, we've discussed it. Do we need to summarize our advice or suggest advice or how do we respond to that? I don't think there's any harm if you wanted to put forward a... Well, I, I think I believe, and hopefully on behalf of the board, that we all absolutely agree that this is an important, it's an important landmark monument. It's an important uh, piece of our history to preserve, absolutely. So whatever that takes, I believe that, um, I think we're all in full support of that. I, I don't really think I'm qualified to make comments on the plaque or the history or the meaning, um, you know, I think that would have to be handled by the two parties here. Um, obviously they're in communication with each other. So it's, and I think we're fortunate to have two amazing organizations, Stanford and 375 that um, are passionate about this project. So that's a total bonus to us. Like we don't have to encourage them to want to preserve it they really want to preserve it. And I assume that they would be raising the funds. I know these projects are not cheap. So hopefully that's not an issue. Um, but I, I just, I'm, I think we should, I mean, it would be my advice to, I absolutely support the, um, the preservation of it. Maybe there's a rededication, maybe there's a learning moment 
that can somehow, I'm sure Stanford uh, would be a great teacher of that. Um, so I, I fully support the preservation, the restoration and everything going forward. Even on its own, I know that there's issues. There's a flagpole, there's a plaque, there's a plinth. There's three issues, but obviously all they, they all have to work together. Um, so I'm, I just wanted to be supportive of the restoration project altogether. Please. <laughs> I just wanted to take just a moment because it came up uh, with uh, Martin's comment from online that the um, regular uh, maintenance and care of the flags at the flagpole has been a, a, a mission and purpose of Post 375. And specifically, we have here in attendance today, former commander of Post 375, Larry Yegi, sitting back here, who has personally taken that as his responsibility for many, many years. So I just wanted to acknowledge Larry. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it, just talking about the, the restoration of the flagpole, um, I did want to ask about, you know, I, I understand that deinstallation of the plaques is an, a, a mitigation for a theft concern. You know, it, it, if there's a restoration of the plaques going forward, has there been an exploration of, you know, perhaps reproductions or, um, you know, a, a way to safeguard the originals while still maintaining the original like look and content of the monument with perhaps, you know, less concerns about a potential theft risk of the original plaques. Um, just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think going forward, there's some work to be done. And um, and I think everybody's well intentioned, which is a good start. Um, and um, I, I'm optimistic that we will have a good outcome on this one and hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, so can we wrap this up? Do we have anything before we wrap up? We have a comment. Where? Lydia? Oh, thank you. Sorry, that little hand did not pop out at me. <laughs> Please, Michael. Unmute. This is Mike McKinnon. Uh, I fully support the uh, preservation and restoration of the uh, the plinth and the flagpole. I think it uh, represents uh, a real significant uh, emotional connection with our veterans organization. And uh, I myself am a veteran, so I have some sensitivity along those lines. But it's, it represents a disrespect of our vets by not having that, that uh, flagpole and the plinth restored to the condition it was in. So I think it's, it's very imperative that we do the right thing, uh, restore the, the, the flagpole and the plinth. And I, I think the, the real <clears throat> issue here is what security measures we can put in place to prevent future damage. Uh, I know there's a lot of uh, security techniques that could be applied to uh, alarm the uh, attempts to desecrate the, the plinth, uh, that might make some sense here. But uh, I, I guess I, I would fully support that we, we go ahead and, and get that uh, historic uh, monument put back the way it was originally. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Ku. Thank you. Um, since this is a study session, uh, I, I would like to request that you ask for a um, follow up on this action uh, for me uh, for a future meeting just to follow up on this action uh, as an action item. Thank you. 
in terms of the restoration, where it is at, I have a follow up on this. So maybe um, Amy, as our liaison, you can. Um, work out something where we can kind of check in every other month or something. So to see that it's not just fallen by the wayside, which is, I guess I understand what she's asking for. Yes, uh, Mayor Kuz, our uh, liaison from the council. Uh, so uh, thank you for that. Um, certainly I will um, remain in touch with uh, Ms. Jones as to um, next steps and, um, you know, yeah, the next opportunity that presents itself to relay status, I will do so. And then of course, when there's a project, um, you know, there's gonna be a formal application and that will be um, presented to the board because it is on our list of inventory properties. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm just kind of struggling with the historic, the, the most sensitive part of this the golden, the sons of the golden west, etc. I'm wondering if this is something that a human relations group should look at, uh, possibly. And I would also like to point out, it seems to me that the purpose of this is to honor the veterans. And it might be possible to separate that from the motivations of contributors or in other areas that are not appropriate to today's social construct. Of all the largest institutions in the United States, the Department of Defense has probably done more to promote equality in terms of literacy, access, promotions. Our Secretary of Defense is a is a African American. Uh, integration in 1948, in many ways, has led the country from those darker days to uh, in in whatever progress we may agree has been made today. So I think that, that somebody needs to look at that if there's gonna be a real conversation about this, whether these things stay or they have some notation with them or they have to be in a museum because they're not unacceptable today. Uh, that's what seems very complicated to me. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, just one additional note, and I would, would like to thank the mayor for uh, her, her recommendation. And I just would like to say that because it's been more than two years since this happened, uh, we think we think the veterans think that it, uh, having some kind of a uh, marker out there to say when we will address this again is actually very important because it certainly seems to be one of those things that's very easy to sort of fall by the wayside unless, unless we're very diligent. Thank you. Thank you. So we will stay on top of this. <laughs> um, and I, I also want to weigh in on the social factors here, but I, I agree with um, board member Heinrich that I think it's important not to bury our history. You know, it's something if people do the research and find out, um, you know, the history of that organization and they object, well, at least they've learned something, you know, and we can, understand that we've made progress and we need to make more progress. And um, I think just pretending like nothing bad ever happened is going nowhere. So I really would prefer not to have that be a huge part of the flagpole conversation. Um, I think that it, there's nothing overtly um, offensive in the plaques themselves. I'm somewhat disappointed, uh, but, but I was interested, you know, it was educational to find out that that group was not always great, but I think if we look back, we'll find that most of our organizations did not always do the right thing through history, unfortunately. But hopefully we are going forward instead of backwards, although some days it's not as clear as others. And with that, can we move on to our work plan? Maybe, Amy, before you start, just one more time. Thank you all for taking the time to be here. We really appreciate your time and attention to this matter. And I think that, once again, it's not just important to Stanford or the veterans. It's important to Palo Alto. This particular flagpole was a primary symbol of Palo Alto at one time.
Okay. Uh, well, there goes our audience, but um, we'll we'll proceed. <laughs> Um, so, uh, as this is, we're on to the next item, which is a combo item, a uh, combo being um, several things, uh, the, the work plan of the, of the past or that we're in currently as of today um, from last year that we submitted to the council, taking a look at how we've done and any comments there, and um, that some of those comments get brought forward into the work plan for the coming year, which, you know, coming tomorrow, I suppose, um, <laughs> through through uh, this time next year. And um, so those two things, the work plans, and then we have the CLG report, which um, is due. And um, we turn in CLG being um, certified local government, which the city of Palo Alto is, um, and we maintain that as um, described in the packet. We have responsibilities and we have training requirements for the members and staff um, to stay stay on our game as far as historic preservation. And then each year we submit an annual report, which the board has a look at. We, uh, the report summarizes the number of meetings held and the period we're talking about for that is um, in the past <laughs> a year, uh, you know, as of uh, from October 2021 to September 20. So we have some time frames here that are all over the place today, but um, such is life. I want to get make sure we get that in the report in. It qualifies us for uh, any grants that come our way uh, through the, the Office of Historic Preservation. So in your packets, um, attachment A is the last year's work plan or the one we're concluding. Attachment B is the upcoming year's work plan, a draft um, carrying through this, the, basically the same with a few tweaks. Uh, goals and projects. Um, we're farther ahead, of course, in one of those projects, which is the inventory update that we're, we've embarked upon. And then um, the CLG report that does that summary of um, you know, all the meetings we had during that time frame and the, uh, the, the properties that were found eligible. This, this period was only two of them found eligible for the California Register. Um, so less than last year. So let's start in. Uh, this work plan, we had 14 meetings. I think that's a record um, uh, during that period. Um, so these were the goals on the screen. There are five goals. Um, the goal one is an ongoing goal, as, it, as is goal two. Um, goal three was, uh, was new for this past year, and we got Got it as far as getting a consultant, you know, um, and kicking it off, and that was um, in February. And we're in progress now. We're getting ready for our community meeting. The outreach and incentives and work program development. Obviously, uh, we can do better with inviting the public and hearing from the public, and I think that's an important task ahead of us. The Mills Act program was a bit stalled out. We've discussed recently. Um, you know, maybe getting a report to council to share the work of that subcommittee that was um, from a year or so ago. And um, so the, the job of the HRB regarding commenting on last year's work plan is um, plan results, the equity in the work, community involvement and activities. So it's in your packet. I'll try to find which packet page number. Um, so any comments, I'll take 94. So yes. Uh, oh, let's see. It's on page 98, I believe. The <coughs> excuse me, last year, uh, the 2022-23 work plan. Um, let's see. And so I guess on the next work plan, which is the draft for, which is on packet page 103. Um, Okay, oh, that one doesn't contain, oh yeah, okay, work plan overview. Okay, well, that's a sample on package page 102. It, it, um, it gives an example of a paragraph about prior year accomplishments. So I think I omitted that page um, in the coming work plan where we would comment. So I'm ready to hear comments on, on um, the five goals of this last year 
anyone has any. One of the things about equity in the work I think is interesting is we just had an item where, um, you know, are we inviting the members of the public? Maybe there are more voices out there that we haven't heard. Maybe there's other venues we could look to. Um, I mean, there are definitely, <laughs> sounds like there's other plaques um, such as the one we talked about today. Um, that's, that's of interest, I think, to the board. Um, and I don't know what are the ways we can look into that in the coming year, uh, but certainly we've had, we've had uh, engagement at this meeting. Well, I'm kind of hoping that our community meeting some preservationist out of the woodwork and we will get some new and exciting community conversations. So, um, and I also, um, I don't know that it really fits in anywhere. And you said council goals don't, you know, aren't, there's no need to address them, but, um, you know, the council priority of climate change and natural environment um, protections and adaptations. I think that, um, you know, preservation and not demolition certainly plays into that, that, um, you know, putting a whole house worth of stuff in the landfill is not help doing anything for the natural environment. And then, um, there are priority number three on housing and social for social and economic balance that, um, you know, maintaining some of our um, housing structure that is not so upscale um, goes a long way towards um, maintaining that in our environment. So um, I think we are addressing some of those issues and that we need to keep them in mind. So if I can ask, um, then <clears throat> to report out on this past year, we can certainly uh, note, I mean, I think the priorities from council pretty much carried forward from last year as well. So um, certainly I can put into that work plan references to council priorities um, that relate to what we're doing. Could we, uh, could we talk a little bit about the NALS Act as well? Uh, I just think the goalposts on this, finishing this, just keep moving out like over 20 years. And I know Margaret, you and David did a lot of work on revising it. Is there a way to take what's been done so far and, su and submit it to staff and get something designed for the council to consider? I mean, I just, they, the work just seems like a treadmill. It goes on and on and on. And I, I don't understand why we can't get a draft in front of the council to decide the particulars, the, how it's gonna be tailored. I, I can answer that in part. Um, I think there's been conversations this year when we've brought up the Mills Act about um, the, from the board looking to, maybe there's an ideal project that would be part of a pilot and that would be um, described along with that pilot program uh, interim, however, you know, one year period where we're testing it out. Uh, I, I had heard that in the past from the board. So just merely sending uh, a, an informational report, hey, this is what the, the board has done, it, it, that's possible. But if the board's interest is in finding a, a, a parcel, a property that would be a test case um, for, for, the, for the program, I, I that's just the question, I guess, is, is that still of interest to the board? Well, it, at least three times in the council was in the session, I've heard at least one member of the council bring this up and urge us to get it done. And I know this is, I think whatever the process is to put a document in place, which is ready for the council to consider and discuss, because they'll probably want to make adjustments to them. They're called tailored for a reason. That, that waiting for an ideal prototype is not, is not going to get us anywhere. I mean, I just, 20 years is long enough. Uh, this town's dealing with a lot of really complex issues, and it seems to be able to address them much more quickly than that. And every other city on the peninsula, as far as I know, has one of these. So I just, I, it just baffles me that it keeps drifting in the sea, as it were. Thank you. Okay, I would suggest, Margaret, as leader, um, oh. wait, hold on. I'm gonna say that we need to reconstitute, refocus our Millsack committee and put 
a detailed document together and um, and bring it to the board that we need to have a serious discussion about it with you know new board members because I don't think we've really addressed that since I've been on the board, did we? We bring it up and then for some reason it just sort Gets of goes postponed. by the wayside. But so I guess I'm the only remaining board member that was involved in our subcommittee back when Emily Vargas was around and Corey Brandon and now um, David was great and he was sort of pioneering it, but I guess now David is retired. So I should take it upon myself to sort of gather the information that we had put together if I even have maybe fragments of it. And then, I mean, maybe we can agendize part of a meeting just to focus on the Mills Act and uh, with newer board members who might not be as familiar with it. So I think maybe we just, I can in the meantime gather the information so I'm more current about where we left off and um, and then just put it on a meeting agenda where we can just focus on it all together and discuss it and throw out ideas amongst ourselves, like what we think the best approach would be. I know that we did present it to the city council and then there was all this talk about the, the school district. It's also has to do with the school district and the, the revenues that they would potentially not get because of the Mills Act. So there's, I think there's a lot, there were a lot of different elements that were involved, which kind of brought a complexity to it that no one could seem to get beyond. So maybe maybe a, as we revisit it, we could be better at moving it forward. Yeah, I, I think it's time to, you know, really start, you know, attacking it. And they're going to be identifying the issues for starters, you know, and then we can take them on one by one. But, you know, this kind of, oh, it's a problem thing. It's not getting us anywhere. So... Well, and it's always been one of our supposed incentives. We don't have very many incentives for people to do historic res pre preservation. So this, I think this has always been our potential incentive for people. Well, David may have retired from the board, but I'm sure he has a lot in this. If you could just get together with him and consolidate the stuff. If maybe you could share it with us, we could just take a look at it so we can understand the state it's in. That Vice Chair Pease, you're a little hard to understand because you're far from the Maybe if she and former member uh, Bauer get together and gather and organize their notes, they could share them with us. And then at least we'd have a sense of what, what there is uh, between all of us. Also, I volunteer again. Um, I did include what had been done in a packet last fall. Um, right. I think it was September, maybe. Um, I will certainly send the link out to that HRB packet that in contains yes, that's right. the latest work of the of the subcommittee um, from back in the day. Yeah. Thank you um, for reminding me that I, it has slipped my yeah. mind. That yeah, I okay. don't know that I saved that one. But there's a, there's a lot of packets link, that come good. through. Yeah, for that. <laughs> Thank you. Is there a way to get just some sort of general feedback from council about this? I mean, <clears throat> study sessions are the way that feedback is obtained. So I could um, talk to the director and let the director know that the HRB is interested in having a study session. If that seems, um, you know, uh, if that seems of interest, um, it, it used to be we would have a joint meeting with the council. I can't recall the last time we had a joint meeting with council. Um, and that would be another place that something, some conversation could take place. Um, but lacking a joint meeting, I think um, trying to find a, a, a council meeting that would accommodate a study session would be um, the way to go if you just wanna have a conversation. Um, I think the more we educate ourselves before that, the better off we'll be. Um, and I think it would be good to at least sort of get some kind of collective opinions about how we want to move forward and how what we would ask from council so that they would have a simple way to agree with us or disagree with us. And I'm happy to join that subcommittee. That needle forward this summer um, in any way that I can. 
great. Thank you. Um, I don't know if this is appropriate on our work plan, but um, my other um, pressing thought is that you know our four categories are just a little sketch. And I think um, we would do much better if we had, I, I read a bunch of ordinances last night when I couldn't sleep. Um, so ask me about Pasadena or San Diego. Yes, it did. <laughs> um, I was just reading about categories. Um, but for our purposes, I think if we just had two and you know, I would throw out historic and landmark. Um, and I think that would accommodate everything we have contributing properties in professorville of course or historic districts would be a third one but um i think if we could just make some minor, minor modifications to our ordinance that would make it clearer because now you know i mean it's like one of the everybody's first questions what's the difference between a three and a four i don't know you know so um i think if we clarified it for ourselves it would be much easier as we have these upcoming conversations with um, the community about their houses being on the inventory. So, but for these minor changes to um, the ordinance, Amy, can't we do that fairly easily? I know how to go through council and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, it, it seems like um, rather than try and rework the whole thing, if we just had, you know, maybe one or two that maybe the Mills Act and categories, you know, that would help us move forward. Certainly that's a goal. If you're saying put that as a goal into the coming work plan, um, we have Mills Act program continuing there as number five. So um, we can refine that further. Um, and I mean, it is a comprehensive plan policy as well to modify the historic ordinance. So we can refer to that comprehensive plan policy. I, I think it would be good to maybe put some, oops, sorry. I think it would be good to have some specifics. So we're more focused on small things that we can all agree on rather than try and rewrite the whole thing and you know upset the apple cart. So the question will be um, which quarter to come forward in the next coming year, starting from you know, tomorrow. Um, we've got, we're gonna be doing the, this reconnaissance and the inventory and coming through with nominations to council. And are you thinking that will happen after all of that? You'd like to pair it? I would, I think it's gonna take a while for these properties to come through to council. And I think before they do, we would do well to at least have our proposal out there. Maybe the ordinance can't be changed that quickly, but if we could get council buy-in prior to that, I think it would help make it much smoother. And I also think it would make the conversations with the public much smoother if we, as a group, um, at least knew what direction we wanted to move in. Because I, I find it hard to believe anybody supports category one, two, three, four. Am I wrong? I, I think this is also something that we've discussed at length in the past in past meetings as well. And there have been, you know, people suggesting let's simplify it, either you're historic or you're not, or maybe just a one and a two. But I, I did see some merit in keeping four, keeping four but more clearly defining them. And not that I want to get into the discussion now, but for instance, category four could be just potentially eligible. That could be a category. So let's make that cat. That's the lowest level. You're potentially eligible. So you're a category four. And I, I think what that does is it gets people familiar with or used to the idea that their house could be potentially historic. And I think being potentially eligible, I think that sounds like a cool designation to be potentially eligible for something. That has a positive feeling for me, so. And we do have a, a whole list of those things yeah, that are that potentially should be category eligible. Four. That's the, that doesn't mean that, that they're historic, but they're just on the radar. Yeah, some of the ordinance did, did have that. I guess part of me was, um, part of my thought process was that, um, 
not necessarily, I mean, we still have four categories, but I don't want to call them one, two, three, four, because I think if they had a name like potentially eligible or landmark, it would be much easier for the public to understand where they fit in and our I, hierarchy. I think that's part of our mission is to better educate the public about these properties that are potentially eligible. Um, so I agree, having more clear designations or names for categories one, two, three, and four, I don't think that we necessarily need to remove categories one through four, but do a better job of um, education about what the potential um, benefits are or- uh, Responsibilities. Yeah, and responsibilities, yes, absolutely. I totally agree renaming the categories into names and not numbers. I I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. I, I think the categories make sense because instead of saying, oh, you're in the professorville category, you could say you're a category three. So we all know instantly what that means. I think we could it could be like category one is on the national register. Category two is on the Palo Alto local highest register. Category three might be Professorville and category four might be potentially eligible. I mean, it could be category four, potentially eligible, but I think the categories give people a scale. For me, it just is, is an easier way to value, like category one would be the most historic on the national register. Well, that's definitely a number one, right? And then two, more local, three, yeah. That's my opinion. So I'd like to propose that we uh, agendize category definitions for our next meeting. Um, I don't agree with Margaret. So um, we can talk between now and then. Um, and I think that, you know, if, if there's, you know, we can bring to the board the different viewpoints. Um, and I think it should be fairly easy to have it as an action item and make a decision. I don't. I think that between us, we should um, be able to identify what's going to be um, the most effective um, naming of categories. Chair Willis, I mean, you said our next meeting. You don't mean the special meeting of April twenty fifth. It's the community outreach. Okay, which um, which meeting are you considering? Well, are we? I am. So I'm thinking our first meeting in May. Okay, so that's. That's a week after the community meeting? Two weeks after the community meeting. No, week after. It's a week after? Isn't it? Oh, sorry, two weeks. Okay, I'm looking at the wrong calendar. Oh, it's like, it's my anniversary. No. <laughs> Focus on ARB, sorry. <laughs> okay, so you'd like to meet on May 11th. Um, yes. We also have an item for the second meeting of May. So um, it's a possibility to have both items on the second meeting. You know, I think we might want to work our way back into two meetings a month while we're trying to work our way through the inventory and bring things to council and um, clarify for the public and, you know, for ourselves, sure. you know, where we're going and how the best way, the best way to get there, you know, and, you know, maybe not over the summer, maybe it's just May and June. And then we, you know, have one meeting in July and August when we, scatter, you know, um, but two meetings in May sounds good to me. So put them on your calendar. <laughs> Just so All you right. know, I will not be able to attend the May 11th meeting. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And respect <laughs> with respect to the 25th uh, with the homeowners, the property owners, is that going to be accessible remotely? The April 25th? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be in the community room and we will definitely have, um, you know, coverage. Because um, yeah. unfortunately, I need to be out of town, but I want to be, have access to that meeting, please. Okay. So I guess we'll, Veronica and I work together, together to get you, um, a Zoom panelist link. Okay, because when I was looking at the, at the flyer and the letter, there's no mention. It gives a date and a physical meeting, but there's no mention whatsoever of being able to remotely participate. I think that really is important to communicate. We don't have very much time to these uh, property owners. Some of them might be more inclined to, to participate then. Yeah. 
on our, um, I believe the notice cards that are going out this week, there's a, scan, there a link? there's a Scantron that leads to the web page. The, on the web page, we can, we can include um, the agenda and it, that will have the link. Okay, kind of like there's no way to communicate beyond directing them. They, they have to go to the web page to find that. Well, they would receive the card that would give them the, the location. I mean, I, you know. Um, but, but there's nothing on the card that says you can remotely access the meeting. Is that, is that right? Did I get that right? I don't think we put that on the notice card. Well, I'm, we could I'm, add, have, have the notice cards gone out. No, okay, I'm, well, I'm a little confused by that because yeah, we can put it on the notice I card. I brought it up uh, quite a few times. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I just was surprised in the letter, in the flyer, that there was no option mentioned explicitly uh -huh. to if you own one of these properties and for whatever reason, it's better for you to access this meeting remotely, you could do that. Okay, so we'll make sure that it's on the notice cards that get sent out later this week. Thank you. So you're you're following up the letters with the notice card? Yes. Okay. Um, I just want to, I know it's a little late now, but I, I think you have to realize some of these owners are not residents of the properties and we need to like sort of feed that into our timelines. So, you know, the odds of them getting that notice card before the meeting might be slimmer than we would like because it might end up with a tenant that needs to afford it or I, I I think that might actually be a good question at our meeting. You know, how many, you know, are remote own, owners that have actually gotten the notice and how, you know, do we need to do something else? Because we have owners' names, don't we? Yes, these are drawn from uh their the system that we have that shows the owners of the addresses that are were on the well, I'm just saying I got one as an owner, just addressed to owner, not to me or my husband. Um, and I mean, it is a, an address that I have access to, but I, um, I would have, okay, I don't know what's on my property deed, damn it, um, excuse me. <laughs> um, but are we, are we sending them to the ones, to the property owners at their, their address and not the property address? I guess that's my question. Uh, yeah, I believe the our just system has the um, owner information. If it's okay, I was just surprised that it only said property owner and wasn't addressed to a person. If you had the actual contact information, yeah, some letters did have. If we did have the owner name, it listed the owner name, and if not, then it was just generic property owner. Okay. Yeah. So is there, um, just to bring it back to the item, um, the goals stated for the work plan, is there um, maybe finish this and then we can get to the more discussion about the community meeting. I, and But also we have the CLG report I need to cover because if I can move to the next item, if anyone has any other comments about an additional goal to add for the work plan, or if you want me to come back at the next meeting, next regular meeting, which would be May 11th with uh, a modified work plan, that would probably be the last opportunity to comment on the work plan for the coming period that would then be transmitted to council. Thank you. I think it would be good to, yeah, sort of refine it. So, you know, comp plan policy, but make it more specific to certain parts of minor ordinance updates. And I'm happy to have a meeting with um, maybe chair and vice chair to go over that plan um, before it gets published in the next, in the packet for May 11th. Um, if you wanted to provide advice as a kind of mini subcommittee there, <laughs> uh, if you would like. Yeah, oh, I was gonna ask if, if reviewing the categories and reviewing our ordinance is included in one of these? I guess, would that be review alterations to his historic resources? No, that's not it. Comprehensive, I mean, would the, rev would the review of the categories 
be want be are already included? Amy or? suggested that the compliant policy L seven point one point one right would include that is the one that related to that. Yeah, I, I think um, if 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 it's not, uh, I think it is. But if it's not, it's an um, umbrella that covers everything. Uh, uh, yeah, it's just it's looking at the ordinance. The ordinance okay. is the one that sets forth. You know, category one is a major resource. Category two is a significant resource. Category three is a contributing or whatever. Category three and four are contributing uh, resources. So, so that so is we need to look at the ordinance itself that sets forth what those categories okay. are. I think. So that would be included in whatever comp plan policy. And I think it is L711, but if it's not, I'll put the right one in there. <laughs> so take up the ordinance. Back to you, Amy. Okay. Um, next, I can't move this. There we go. So our, our annual CLG report, I did reach out, I had um, uh, Veronica reached out to you to uh, share what I came up with as your trainings based on emails that I'd received over the, the period. So the period is from October, 2021 through September, 2022. So if there's, if you've taken a look at the CLG report where I cited the trainings. Um, and if I'm wrong, let me know and I'll fix that because I do want to send that out today or tomorrow to the Office of Historic Preservation. So just in brief, it does um, it does note that we had 15 meetings during that re review pe or reporting period um, and the, the kinds of activities we we did. And then um, I'll share the, the, the those uh, properties found eligible during that time time frame, and uh, noting that we proceeded along the important project of the historic inventory update. So hopefully you've all had a chance to look at that CLG report. So I will be able to say that you did <laughs> in my letter cover memo to the OHP. Amy, I thought it looked fine. I just have one little under the commission membership and where you recorded the professional, um, you know, details. After David's name, there is a date. Um, I think it's just misplaced, but. Um... Oh. Yeah, I, I think I also had sent out the form for everyone to kind of fill out. Um, I haven't seen any of those coming back, that was a statement of qualifications. So if, if you can get those to me, if not, I'll fill them out for you and do my best. Um, can you resend the forms to us? Yes. Sorry. Or is it in the packet? Uh, no, I sent them through email, I thought. Um, and okay. it's like an interactive form that you like fill out. Yeah. They, they change them each year. So I, mm -hmm. I can't just okay. use last year's form. But this is what we fill out to say what are what um, education. Yeah, event, this year there's events. boxes that say I'm this, I'm that, I'm the other thing, right? Okay. In, in my profession and what have you. So yeah, if you it's tedious it, form work, which a lot of this stuff is. Is this primarily around the continuing education stuff? No. No, it's the other. That's a separate thing. Okay. Yeah. So. I don't know that we saw that one. No, I, I don't know. Is that the is that the one the non conflict of interest or the do you make money? I what, what is that one form that we have to do every year that comes no, from the that's a serve yeah. on the board. That's not what you're talking yeah. about. This okay. is specifically for the Office of Preservation as part of this annual CLG report. Okay, yeah, if you could resend it. I don't okay. remember, I don't recall seeing that. Will do. Good job, Amy. <laughs> Thank you for doing that for us. <laughs> I know it's like hurting for this cats board and here. for the Planning and Transportation Commission. Yes, uh, lots of boxes. Practice, huh? Uh, okay. Well, thank you. Um, so, moving on to approval of minutes from our last meeting. Um, does anybody have any corrections or changes to the minutes? Seeing nothing, do I have a motion to approve? 
I move to approve the minutes of the meeting. What's the date? April 13th? No. Excuse me. I second it. Thank you. Any comments or nothing? Um, so all in favor? Aye. 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 Nope. Aye. Not you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the motion passes. Um, so board members, well, so I guess we interjected many of our comments and um, questions in the middle of our other items here today, but is there anything um, that we want to bring up now before we adjourn? Yes, I'd like to know where the uh, resolution for the Burge Clark Centennial is. Well, I did see in the minutes that I had agreed to do that, and I totally thought I had palmed it off on somebody else. So I was in Italy having a really good time. <laughs> and I, I did not talk to the city clerk or anybody else. So I, if that one was in my court, it is totally dropped. When is the centennial? And is there, what are the plans? Just briefly. The centennial is of Burge Clark's opening of his office here in Palo Alto. So it's been a hundred years. Past and Paha are recognizing Burge Clark on, they have a special presentation on May 7th at the um, community, no, the art center near Rinconada Park. And they thought it'd be nice if someone did a resolution honoring Burge Clark. Lydia, <laughs> can I recruit you to um, do that if I get somebody to draft it for you or help draft it with you, depending on your preference? Absolutely. Um, um, you know, a, a place that I've been um, getting a lot of help from on these resolutions and historical facts is from Palo Alto Museum. So we can, you know, you can always um, reach out and see if they would help with the um, language on the resolution, but I'll be more than happy to um, work on the um, resolution. So and you might want to ask the clerk about whether it should be a resolution or a proclamation. A resolution is going to require the council's vote. On a proclamation, we can just get it um, done. Proclamation it is. So can I get somebody on the board to follow up with? Who who do you talk to on the his um, with the museum? Um, there's um, Mr. Steiger or okay. Ms. Holman. Okay, so that sounds good. Thank you. Do you want me to follow up with them? I, I do. I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Um, and also, you might actually have some advice on this, Mayor Koo, but I would like to um, propose that the Historic Resources Board has a liaison with the museum board. Um, we um, do that with past heritage now, but I think that um, we're all anxious to see the museum move forward. Um, and it sounds like finally it is, so hallelujah. Um, so um, if you would support that with the museum board, if you talk to anybody, that would be great. And I guess I will, I will actually do this instead of just saying I will, I will follow up with um, the board president and see if I can arrange that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anything further? Yeah, have we had a chance to welcome Samantha to our, <gasps> I mean, I, I was a few minutes late, but I don't want to miss out on that. <laughs> Okay, She's well, we face. did briefly, but we had quite the audience at the time. So we were kind of uh, moving I'm through sorry. it well, quickly. My fault. My we, fault. we didn't make her, want to make her look like too much of a newbie, but, um, <laughs> but we are very happy that she joined us. And if you would like to chime in on that one, that would be great. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, 
my credentials, which I think I, I talked about over coffee. Uh, I'm currently pursuing my master's in public history at CSU East Bay. Um, I'm finishing my first year there. I have an undergraduate degree from UC Santa Barbara in history. Um, I've been in the corporate world, in the technology world for the last 10, 12 years. And so I'm making a career change. Um, and my rescue dog, Bo and I live in a yellow 1926 cottage in one of Palo Alto's bungalow courts on Homer. So I have a, a vested interest in historic preservation and I'm very, very happy to be here. Thank you. And I, I love the fact that you bring some different perspectives to the board. You know, it's really nice to kind of reach out the web, spread the web. And anything further before we adjourn? Uh, just a reminder that PAST has the walking tours of all the historic neighborhoods uh, starting this Saturday, and they will continue through the month of May. And if you go to their website, they'll list which neighborhoods and when. Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. Thank you, Gogo. Um, great. So um, if nothing further, we'll adjourn. Um, do I have a motion? I'll move to adjourn. And a second? I'll second. Thank you. I should remember this. Do we need a voice vote on this one? or I mean, do we need a roll call on this one? OK, so all in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Thank you. And the motion passes. <laughs>